Hello, everybody. Hello, Roy. Hi. I'm very happy to have Roy here this morning because I was uh, going to do a very angry rant in the morning. And now Roy calls and we decide to switch to a very happy conversation, I hope. Although I don't know every detail of this conversation. Roy, is it a happy conversation? It's have. very happy. It's the um, intersection uh, of of passion between uh, Jews and Italians, just about everybody. You don't have to be Jewish or Italian. It's about food and wine. So, yeah. Uh, all the secrets about uh, Jewish Italian cuisine. And to remind everybody, uh, Roy is probably the most notable uh, lecturer on matters of uh, Vatican and art and uh, Italian things. Uh, with the first, uh, he, he's the first. You're the first Jewish uh, guy to, in Vatican, right? Officially, the first religious, uh, first religious. Uh, Orthodox Jewish guide in the Vatican. And to top it off, you're in Israel right now, in, in Jerusalem. Yeah. So you have the full set. So with this, with this, we will proceed. And uh, of course, this is an evening conversation, my friends. But you feel free to go and uh, you know do as you you will be told <laughs> in the morning if you're on the east coast, and a little bit early probably for the west coast. But uh, Roy, um, I'll give you the floor. Give me a second. Uh, this is our first picture here, and this is uh, what we're going to talk about what is manja well uh, manja it means eat and uh, italian mama is always saying a manja manja eat eat and the uh, jewish mothers are always saying s s eat eat so uh we have a riddle in rome um what is the difference between an italian mama and uh, a jewish mama uh, the answer is that the Italian mother looks at a child not eating and says, man, man, eat, eat. You don't eat, I'm going to kill you. And the uh, Jewish mother says, yes, yes, eat, eat. If you don't eat, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> There's always a little difference. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's what we are about. Little differences. So now the next slide. Yes. Well, um, what happened is that uh, long before the revolts against Rome, uh, the uh, the Jews were put in charge of the largest import export business in all of history, which is the Roman Empire. Um, even we arrived, uh, they brought us in to start running things. Um, centuries before the empire, when it was still just the Republic of Rome. We even have in the uh, second book of Maccabees, we have the actual transcript of the uh, treaty between the Jews who lived in what was called then in Latin Judea and the Roman, uh, the Roman government. So what did we need from the Romans? Well, we had already won uh, back the Holy Temple. It's the holiday of Hanukkah that we commemorate every year. Um, and uh, we needed help cleaning out the rest of the country from the military occupying force of the Greco-Assyrians. And it took quite some time. And uh, Judah Maccabee decided he was going to make a partnership with this up and coming military power called the Romans. So uh, they came in and I, I do lectures just about this connection between uh, the Jews and the uh, ancient Romans. It's fascinating and it's not uh, the black and white world that we uh, would tend to think in. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, we needed them to help us militarily uh, win against the Greco-Assyrian military occupation. And slowly, slowly, we kicked them out of all of Judea. Um, but the Romans, at first, were our partners, our military allies. Uh, and uh, year after year, the uh, balance of power shifted. It went from equal partners to uh, being under the protection of Rome, then being a colony of Rome, and finally just being slaves of Rome. Um, but what did the Romans want from us? 
They had already conquered uh, almost all of the coasts of the Mediterranean Sea. And you see the uh, red lines all over this map here. Those were international highways made with slave labor. Big parts of these highways are still existent today, 2,000 years later. Um, so they had shipping lanes, they had these international highways, huge import-export. What did they need us Jews for? Uh, they had one problem in ancient Rome. Of course, this problem would never, ever uh, exist in modern Italy today. It's called corruption. And uh, it was so corrupt that they didn't trust each other and um, they needed a group of people. Here's what the uh, skill description was that they needed back then. They needed people who were known for their honesty. They needed people uh, who could read, write, and speak uh, the different languages of international trade. They needed to know Egyptian, Aramaic, Greek, Latin, etc. cetera. Um, and in most other countries, the people were entirely illiterate, even in their own language. Um, the Jews spoke all of these languages, and of course, Hebrew. Um, so uh, we were running the show for the Romans. Uh, this is certainly not the first time this happened. Uh, the ancient Persian Empire put us in charge of their import-export as well. Um, wherever the Jews went, this seemed to be uh, recognition of their skills, especially in, uh, in, in business. So uh, we're spread all over the empire. and um, we start putting in cultural uh, bits and pieces all over the empire. We start taking in uh, great ideas in food and wine and also uh, shipping them out to the whole empire. Uh, uh, let's uh, move to the next one. And uh, I'm gonna start off with a secret that a lot of people do not know right off the bat. Um, one thing that we spread all over the empire, uh, wherever the Jews were, they set up places of worship. And of course, uh, we had the Shabbat every seventh day, every Yom Shvi'i, uh, which is seventh day. So what do we put on our table? Uh, I'm going to have to put my glasses on because the screen's very tiny here. Here we go. So uh, first is ner, which means a candle or a light. It should say lights because we... we um, we uh, light two candles together, uh, but uh, it's singular. Why? Because those two letters in gematria, which is Jewish mystical numerology, uh, the uh, value of the word ner is seven. It's actually seven, uh, 70, but zero doesn't count for anything. So it's seven, it's reduced to seven. Uh, then we've got challah, the braided bread, and that also uh, breaks down to the number seven. Also um, with the value of seven is dog, fish. This is why every uh, Friday night on almost every Shabbat table, there is fish to start off the meal. Again, the number is seven. Uh, and then for the main course, it's almost always, except at my house, I'm, I, I don't eat meat, um, but in most Jewish homes, there is basar, which is uh, the, the central meat dish. And basar adds up to, you guessed it, seven. And finally, yayin. Here's uh, from a new uh, vineyard, a new uh, religious Jewish vineyard in the middle of Tuscany. A friend of mine set this up and has, and he's making gorgeous wines like this, Il Generoso. Um, so if you go to Italy or there's somebody uh, that's distributing uh, amazing kosher wines from Italy, do not miss uh, uh, this cantina. It's Cantina Cignozza in the heart of Tuscany. End of commercial. <laughs> <laughs> we love commercials. <laughs> it's not a commercial. It's just uh, no, no, no. It's good. I'm just wondering if we can long. get it here in Brooklyn. Yeah, that would be great. Um, let's look at the next slide. So, uh, how did they? You just saw this these huge distances that the import export business had to cover. Well, um, they had an ingenious design. It was already ancient by the time the Jews started working uh, with the Romans, uh, called amphorae or amphoras. Uh, 
Uh, and that means double handle. And you see that all of these uh, earthenware containers have a double handle. And this is for shipping purposes. They would pack them in straw on racks and then loop um, rope through those double handles and hold it really steady so it couldn't break, couldn't spill. Um, and uh, again, we could talk for hours just about this whole culture. It's amazing. If I were half a kilometer away from a uh, import ship bringing in really good stuff from all over the empire to Rome, I could look at the different amphora jars and I could tell you where they came from and what was in them. Uh, sort of like uh, if you've ever had dim sum, the waiter at the end of the meal looks at the colors and the shapes and the sizes of your used dishes and knows exactly what you ate. Mm -hmm. Here, you could look at uh, these. For instance, on the very left, mm -hmm. you've got a cylindrical one. That's a design of the uh, amphoras that came out of Carthage, which is today Tunisia. And that was probably oil. Um, and then uh, you've got next to it, uh, another cylindrical one. And then the third one in, uh, that's uh, probably Greek. It's hard to see in this photo. Um, and then there's the tall one in the middle. And next to that one, there's one with a sharp edge around the neck. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's usually the sign of coming from Egypt. So what did the Jewish amphora look like? How would we know it came in from Judea? Well, look at the extreme right. You see that one with the huge pot belly, mm -hmm. swollen with goodies inside? That's the Jewish one saying S, S. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, would it kill them to make a flat bottom for any of them? Uh, what was this thinking? So you, they wouldn't be put sideways to prevent um, spilling? They, they, most of them did not have... Um, a flat bottom. You see the yeah. third one in from the left. It has a pointy bottom. Most of them in the back there have pointy bottoms. You stick it in the sand and it'll uh -huh. stay upright. Um, also, uh, when you're shipping it in a wagon, a cart, or on a boat, um, uh, it's the point is packed with straw and put in a hole in a rack, mm -hmm. and that way it's held perfectly still and won't mm -hmm. break. Nice. So... Um, the question is, how did they get so much kosher wine and kosher oil all over the empire? Believe it or not, when they were excavating the ruins of Pompeii that was covered with volcanic ash uh, in the year 79, uh, when they were digging it out in the 17, 1800s, um, they found uh, big round jars like that. And on it, it said oleum castum or vinum custom. Uh, and uh, that means kosher oil or kosher wine. So we know for a fact that uh, kosher products were being shipped out to the Jews who were scattered throughout the entire Roman Republic and then the empire. So everybody could make sure they got their kosher products. But how did you get so much kosher uh, wine, let's say, to uh, the whole Roman Empire with that huge extent that we saw? Well, very interesting. We have to think of Coca-Cola today in our, in our lifetime. How do they get Coca-Cola all over the world? They don't put it in the cans and then ship those cans in heavy crates everywhere. What they do is they have pressurized jars filled with syrup. They reduce the Coke, the Coca-Cola down to a thick gummy syrup. It's almost like axle grease on a car. Mm -hmm. um, it's undrinkable. But when it arrives to the country of its destination, they've got fizzy water. And they, in, like you see in a, in a bar to this day, they put the syrup in whatever thing, they, the container, and they put in the fuzzy wa fizzy water. And uh, no, we're not up to that one not yet. yet. Okay. Not yet. And uh, okay. thank you, though. Uh, anyway, uh, and you mix it up, and lo and behold, you've got, Coca-Cola. So they shipped reduced wine. Wine syrup is what I call it. it. The Talmud talks about it and says you can't even make a blessing over it because it's so thick um, and tastes so awful, this reduced wine. You can't say the blessing that you would say over wine until you mix it 50-50 with water. And then you reconstitute it and it's uh, wine again. 
So um, this is uh, how they got the wine to the whole empire by uh, by doing something that Coca-Cola is imitating to this day. <laughs> but listen, um, it's interesting that I, I read that ancient Greeks they also they they would add water to wine uh, when before drinking. Was it yes. the same kind of? Uh, uh, it's the same idea. It's the same. We were doing it, so everybody else was doing it. So the ancient Greeks, the ancient Roman pagans, uh, everybody was doing it. If you go to uh, a, a Christian mass uh, in uh, many denominations in the Christian world, when the officiant, uh, the priest or the minister, whoever is doing uh, setting up communion, of course, my reference is, is uh, the Catholic Church because I'm inside the Vatican so often, uh, that the priest there, um, in, in order to have the holy wine in the chalice in the in the fancy cup um they put in wine and they put in water so even in the mass this is commemorated mm -hmm. uh still in many jewish homes around the world depending on the family and depending on the the, the background what community they're in uh some of them uh, we'll leave a little bit of a gap from the rim of the wine cup and put wa uh, the wine in up to here and then the rest water. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is still commemorated in many places around the world. Wow. Um, now, uh, there's many traditions with wine. Again, if, if I could just talk about the Italian superstitions and traditions with wine. Uh, that would be a whole other, uh, whole other yeah. discussion. Um, there's, it's such a rich history uh, and heritage of dealing with food and wine. But there's one thing in particular. If you wanted uh, to get, for instance, as much uh, wine out of uh, this bottle as possible, how would you get everybody else to give up their wine and you would take their wine from them? Very simple. Normally, let me get this in here. Normally we pour like this. If you want an Italian, especially somebody born and raised in Italy, if you want them to push away their wine glass so you can have it, very simple. Pour it backhanded. Here we can look at the next slide. Uh-huh. There we go. If you pour it backhanded like that, um, you are uh, you're going to get a lot of people uh, pushing their glass back at you. Uh, as a matter of fact, in order to get this photo, I had to go to a non-Italian source because uh, Italians would never pour backhanded. Uh, it's considered very bad luck. Why? Very interesting, very interesting tradition. I told you um, we've been for centuries in Rome. As a matter of fact, that Book of Maccabees, the tr peace treaty is signed by both parties in the year 162 before the Common Era, before zero. Uh, so uh, we're there for three centuries as uh, free people before the revolts against Rome. Anyway, uh, when you pour backhanded like this, it's called, especially if you're with people who are many generations in Rome, um, their families, uh, it's called versare alla giudia. It, that means pouring wine Jewish style. This is uh -huh. not anti-Semitic. Anybody who has done volunteer work for a Jewish burial association knows that this is a very negative uh, way to pour wine. This is how you take the pitcher of water and pour it over the corpse of the deceased person. So uh, to show that uh, this is not something you're happy to do, you're not happy the person's dead, you're not happy that uh, the person's being uh, uh, being buried. So a pouring backward is for a traditional Jew, a sign of death. So mm -hmm. the ancient Romans 23 centuries ago got this uh, superstition from us. Uh -huh. We don't get any royalties for this, but uh, 
they uh, they still will do it, and they'll say, "Oh, oh, oh that's pouring Jewish style, uh, Versailles and Judea." Uh, mm-hmm. And again, there's many, many other uh, stories about that. I can't resist. I can't resist. <laughs> what did the pagan uh, pagan Romans do with wine? They would go once a year, every year on the Day of the Dead, the anniversary of the death of their um, their family member, and they would go to the tomb. And if they're buried in a sarcophagus, a stone box to hold the body, over uh, the the lid on the um, tomb, on the lid over the head area, there would be holes and clay straws inserted through the holes. Um, and there'd also be a larger hole. So there'd be um, a hole to pour in wine that would splash over the skull of the dead ancestor. And also another bigger hole to rip off pieces of meat or food, whatever their favorite dish was. And they would do these offerings to their dead ancestors. And when they would and they would have a toast with the dead. They'd pour it in through the straws of the tubes into the uh, tomb below. And then they would drink uh, a drink of wine with their um, dead ancestors saying, ad defunctus. Ad defunctus, to the defunct one, to the dead, to the dead. Mm. Now, the Jews in ancient Rome, they say, well, wait a minute. We don't want people thinking that we're doing pagan rituals. We, we don't do that. We're, we're Jews. We don't do paganism. So uh, we've got to figure out a way to distance or differentiate mm-hmm. ourselves from the ancient Romans going uh, to the dead, to the dead, ad defunctus. So we came up with the opposite. L'chaim, to life. And if you've ever wondered where the expression comes from, now you know the secret. It's from ancient <laughs> Rome to uh, separate our our rituals from the pagan rituals. Beautiful. Uh, let's keep going. See what else we got here. Yes, this was somebody who was a big, big friend of the Jews. Uh, you might have heard of him, uh, Julius Caesar. <laughs> So uh, he uh, is known as a great general, a great writer in Latin, and also I think he's the inventor of the comb forward. <laughs> you could make fun of anything about him. His soldiers would tease him about uh, many intimate things uh, that I wouldn't discuss here, but uh, you didn't dare mention his receding hairline. <laughs> so <laughs> you can even see in the busts, he has uh, the straggles of hair. He combs yeah. it forward to cover up as much as possible. Um, <laughs> anyway, he was a big friend to the Jews. Um, we saved his life from a conspiracy in ancient Egypt. Um, and uh, he did great things for us. He would not uh, compel Jews to serve in the army. It was a universal conscription back then. Everybody got drafted, except for the Jews. And they said, Caesar, great Caesar, why, why are you allowing the Jews not to fight? He said, look, this is an actual quote. What am I going to do with soldiers who can only eat kosher food, and every seventh day they have to put down their sword and shield because it's Shabbat? <laughs> So he said, they manage the empire, they run our import export, they supply us with all the latest things, great food for the army, everything else. Let them do what they do well and don't force them to do something they do badly. So uh, he also, because we're talking about food, he, he changed several rules. As a matter of fact, if you're studying to become a lawyer or a um, historian of Italian and, and Roman law, you have to know about the Judean, uh, the Julian Code. Uh, the Julian Code is uh, his um, code of law that he developed when he took over the country. And um, one thing he did uh, had to do with famines. Uh, famines were quite common in the ancient world, uh, and uh, Rome suffered a great deal. Part of it was because of corruption, uh, but uh, they often had food shortages. So what would happen when they had a food shortage? Every poor person in town would line up like a soup kitchen. You'd have your basket or your sack 
and uh, you'd come up to the counter and they'd say, how many people in your house? And they say, uh, me, my wife, and three children. Okay, he, boom, boom, he has five eggs, he has two cups of flour, and you got just enough to get you through day by day. And every day you'd have to stand on the line and receive your free food um, and oil and all of that. Uh, Julius Caesar said, not the Jews. They saved my life, in, my life in Egypt. So from now on, on Fridays, the Jews get double portions so they don't have to go online on Saturday. That's their Sabbath. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and the Jews were so grateful for him. Um, he did other things as well, but that's, uh, again, a whole other lecture about the, the legal history. Um, so uh, the, uh, to give you an idea how grateful the Jews were, uh, in all of our uh, 3,000, 4,000 years of history, there's only uh, two people whose names are given to religious Jewish children. Uh, Jewish children, if the family is religious, even now, culturally, it, it's come back into style, which is to give your child a name from the Bible. So uh, Jewish kids are getting biblical names again. Um, but there's two exceptions, two pagans who were very, very good to us and very protective of us. One was Alexander the Great, which is why you will meet often uh, religious Jews with the name Alexander or Sandy, like Sandy Koufax, the Jewish baseball player, mm -hmm. et, et cetera, and, or women named uh, Alexandra. This is quite common in the uh, Orthodox Jewish communities, these two names. Um, so one is uh, derivatives of Alexander and the other is uh, Julius for Julius Caesar. He was such a good friend of the Jews that Orthodox rabbis uh, ruled that you could name your child after Julius Caesar. Right. Um, so we had uh, the sculptor, Jules Epstein, um, and uh, the, uh, of course, uh, Julius Marx, better known as Groucho. Uh, okay. So um, uh, the name Julius is quite honored. Uh, and part of it is uh, how he um, was very generous with uh, food for the Jews during uh, shortages. So um, let's go to the next one, see what we have. Uh, we're still in ancient Rome here. Now, um, when you want to know uh, where some of these Jewish dishes come from or where they landed. Remember, it's a cross-pollination. Uh, they got some recipes from us. We got some recipes from them. Um, and uh, to this day, if you're in Rome and you ask anybody who runs a restaurant or anybody who writes about uh, food, uh, the uh, culinary life in, in Rome, uh, they can list so many different dishes that are signature dishes for Rome. Um, and almost all of them, except the ones that have shellfish or pork, uh, almost all of them are Jewish dishes. Uh, and it's being immortalized in uh, the writings of Catullus, mm -hmm. um, who's in the first century before zero, before the common era. And, um, uh, oh yes, uh, Apicius, uh, we get the um, uh, the word Epicurean from Apicius, mm -hmm. uh, and he's in the first century of the Common Era, after the year zero. And they are the first ones to collect these ancient recipes, even when they're writing, these are considered old recipes, um, and they preserve them. So it's not just Roy's opinion, these are documented right. 2,000 years ago. Uh, so uh, let's see some of the stuff that they are talking about. Well, um, we have to go back to the second emperor of Rome, who was Tiberius, mm -hmm. um, and he had a problem of, uh, of pirates uh, ruling the Mediterranean and uh, uh, attacking and seizing uh, Roman ships, and they needed some really tough people to... Um, to uh, act as uh, a defense force against these uh, marauding pirate uh, thieves. So uh, Tiberius took 4,000 young Jewish men and women and forcibly relocated them to the island of Sardinia in Italian, Sardinia. 
Good. Um, and uh, there it is in yellow in the middle of the map. You can see how close it is to the rest of Italy. And it's not a small island. And uh, a place where there had been no Jews, uh, to, uh, the emperor suddenly shoved in over 4,000 young men and women to have a uh, Jewish community there. And their one job was to protect the uh, Roman ships from all the pirates. So, and this is what they did. Now, we don't have remains of synagogues in, uh, that I know of in, uh, in Sardinia. Uh, it was conquered many times and uh, there's not a lot that remains from that period there. Um, maybe some uh, pagan columns from pagan temples, I would guess, but uh, there's not a lot there. But we do have other clues that tells us of a Jewish presence there for over 2000 years. Uh, so let's go to the next one, uh, and we'll look at a few examples of Jewish Sardinia. Now, um, what the Bible says about the land of Israel, it's called a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm sure uh, most of you have heard this expression before. Why milk? Why honey? Well, uh, they symbolized two different concepts in the ancient world. Uh, uh, the milk is a sign of charity, of benevolence. Uh, think of a mother nursing her child. So um, uh, I don't know if I'm gonna get into trouble by saying a mother and nursing her child, uh, but the other pronouns don't work. Not right here, you're safe. You're in the safe space. I'm in my safe space. Yeah. So uh, I need my blanket. So <laughs> anyway, um, so milk, to give you an idea, uh, the Talmud talks about this. The Talmud is the Jewish sages commentaries about the Bible um, 2000 years ago, filled with brilliant insights and amazing, uh, uh, amazing knowledge uh, long ahead of its time. And one thing the uh, rabbis talk about is the concept of if a woman is, um, is nursing, uh, that will make her produce even more milk. The act of giving milk makes you produce even more milk. This was proven to be scientifically accurate in the 20th century. Um, so uh, the uh, milk is seen as a kind of uh, loving kindness yeah. of nurturing. Why honey? Honey in the ancient world, and the Romans uh, believe this thoroughly, honey was a preservative. If they wanted to preserve somebody's body and they didn't have mummification, they would uh, pack the uh, corpse in honey. And uh, they actually found examples where that did indeed preserve the body for a very long period of time. Um, so uh, it's a land that uh, preserves its past, preserves its wisdom, preserves its sovereignty, and milk, the, it's a place of generosity and taking care of each other. So um, this is the secret behind that uh, expression. Well, uh, what did the ancient Romans do? Uh, what did they get from the Jews? Uh, recipes of wonderful food made with, you guessed it, milk and honey. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the next one. So uh, here we are in Sardinia, and this is a signature dish of Sardinia. If you tell somebody you ate this, they, they know that you really were in Sardinia. Uh, and this is pecorino or sheep cheese, um, sardo, which means from Sardinia, uh, with honey. They have a very special honey there. It's not too sweet. It's got a sour tang to it, which is really delicious. Um, and many of the dishes, you'll melt the cheese on top of this very thin, it looks like matzah. Mm -hmm. it, looks like, it is unleavened bread. Uh, they call it carta de musica, um, uh, music sheet. Um, and uh, they melt the, the uh, cheese on top of that and then drizzle the uh, sour honey on top. It's exquisite. Um, and oftentimes they'll just put the uh, cheese right in the pan without the bread and you'll just have sauteed cheese with the honey on top. Absolutely amazing. And this is 
the number one signature dish, to my knowledge, uh, in Sardinia. Let's look at the next uh, um, Jewish Sardinian dish. Uh, this is uh, pardulas. Uh, and uh, a pardula, it looks like the sun. It looks like a, a, a wheel with gears on it. Uh, and this is, uh, they have two versions, the sweet uh, or the salty. It depends on which, which kind of cheese you use. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it's if you put salt in the recipe or sugar. Uh, but uh, these, again, uh, once you make these, uh, you drizzle the Sardinian honey on top. So you will have the dairy and the honey. Um, now, uh, what's also interesting is there's several traditions about these uh, pardulas. And um, th they're either made on the uh, night, evening of Halloween or, in most cases, the night before Christmas. So the idea is before something good can happen, like All Saints on 1st of November or um, uh, Christmas, um, you've got uh, nights when evil spirits are around. Uh, you've uh, got a witch that wants to eat children that uh, supposedly haunts uh, different parts of Sardinia. And uh, people would put these out so that uh, the, the evil witches, the evil spirits wouldn't uh, take their children and eat their children, God forbid. So um, what's interesting is uh, mostly this is famous in Sardinia as the number one pastry for Easter and Easter is the spring. Easter is oh. when finally we uh, change the calendar because there's more sun each day and less darkness. So it looks like a sun with its rays coming out of it. Um, and what's also interesting is where they put these pastries in order to keep uh, the deadly spirits or the deadly witch away from the home. Three guesses uh, where they uh, would display these to protect the family. Or by the entrance? Yeah, think of the Passover story. Yeah. <laughs> On the doorposts. On the doorposts, oh, wow. So uh, again, you've got these things that are a mixture of pagan and Jewish all throughout Sardinia to this day. Let's go to the next one. Sardinia is one of the first places where they found the traces of human settlements, uh, by the way. The, one of the most yes, they've ones. got these Neolithic tombs. We still don't know how they got these huge, huge stones to sit on top of other stones, these dolmens, they're called. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, also in Malta, there's very yeah. ancient uh, pagan. Giganja. Giganja. Yeah, I've been there. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and the last one here, again, it's a mixture of milk and honey, or in this case, cheese and honey are sabatas. Now, um, the name gives us a clue to his Jewish orient, uh, origins. Sabbath. But, Sabbath. Sabbath. Right there, Sabbath, in the name of the pastry. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, now speaking of uh, the word clues, we're going to look at one more slide here. And uh, these, this is the uh, dialect of Sardinia. It's uh, very different from mainstream Italian. Uh, it's like its own language. Uh, if somebody's speaking Sardinian uh, in a film or on TV in Italy, they need subtitles. That's how different it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so the month of September in normal Italian would be settembre. Uh, here in, in uh, Sardinia, it's capidanno, which literally means the head of the year. How do you say head of the year in Hebrew? Rosh Hashanah, <laughs> Jewish New Year's. Um, and uh, Friday, Friday nights uh, in Sardinian, it's called Cena Pura, which means a pure or holy or kosher dinner. Uh, now, why would this uh, be used? Because the Catholics, which were all Christians back then, uh, when Christianity uh, came into existence throughout the Roman Empire, um, they, uh, in the Council of Nicaea in the year 324, under the Emperor Constantine, he makes it uh, Christianity the state-protected or sponsored religion. And um, the, uh, the, uh, 
the church makes as many differences, just like we said l'chaim instead of ad defunctus, the new Christian church started doing things that were uh, to distinguish themselves from the Jews. For instance, when the Jews went in to pray, they would cover their heads. So what do uh, Catholics do when they enter a church? They uncover their heads. Um, also, uh, the uh, Jews, if they didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a lot of wherewithal for food, um, if they could only afford meat once a week, it would be Friday night in honor of the incoming Sabbath. So what did the early uh, Catholics do? They said Fridays, no meat. Mm -hmm. to differentiate themselves from the pre But the priests still wear the, 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 the caps, right? In, yeah, uh, it's, uh, it, it, for them, it's a sign of who's, who's running the show, who's, uh, who's in charge. So, uh, but uh, rank-and-file Catholics, no. Um, uh, when I first was uh, working inside the Vatican, um, one young overzealous uh, guardian there came up to me and said, hey, Hats off in here. Uh -huh. I said I was holding my uh, my winter cap. I said my hat is off. This stays. Uh, and I said, uh, "You're going to tell the Pope to take off his." <laughs> and everybody around us went, "Bravo, bravo!" You tell him. You tell him. <laughs> and that was the last time anybody uh, gave me a problem about my uh, kippa. So, um, so yes, uh, the Jewish kippa is still in evidence. Popes wear them, uh, cardinals and monsignors and, and bishops. But uh, other than that, other than Catholic hierarchy, the rank and file Catholics don't don't cover their heads. Uh, but uh, what they did do was they said no meat on Fridays, and this was um, uh, this was observed uh, until 1963. Vatican II said you don't have to do that anymore. Uh, but still, to this day, there's uh, elderly Catholics and very traditionalist Catholics who still won't eat meat on Fridays, but um, but the Jews would. So on Sardinia, what's that uh, linguistic trace of Jewish roots? Calling Friday nights Chenapura, the, the uh, kosher, holy, or pure dinner. In other words, when you would eat meat. Uh, let's keep going. This is now we're in Rome. Now, we've seen all of these dishes with dairy and honey uh, from Sardinia, but here in Rome, uh, in ancient uh, Latin, it was called uh, placenta. Uh, in modern uh, Roman dialect, it's called cassola, and it's made with a lot of egg yolks, gives it a very uh, warm, sunny uh, orange or yellow uh, look inside, and, uh, and it's sprinkled with powdered uh, sugar, but uh, orig now they use sugar, but originally it was soaked in uh, honey or honey water. Uh, still, where do you find this in Rome? In the former Jewish ghetto. And it's delicious, but it tastes nothing like uh, the New York cheesecake you would think of. This no. is almost like a, uh, uh, a sponge cake. Yeah, yeah, I can tell. Next. Uh, yeah. By the way, our friend Felix is watching and saying hi. Oh, hi, Felix. Cocktail. <laughs> All right. So uh, I was just here again uh, uh, several months ago. This is Pitigliano. Uh, it's the little Jerusalem. It is astounding. The whole mountaintop that this uh, little town is based on goes back to the Etruscans. This is before there was ever a Rome. And they would dig out this very soft, malleable clay uh, underground and bring it out into the light and the air, and it would solidify in whatever form you wanted it um, and become harder than marble. Uh, so they would dig out the inside of the mountain, make tombs down there, and then use the clay for building blocks for building a whole city on top. Uh, so it's all the same material. The entire uh, city is one big block of this tufa clay stone. Um, and this, for uh, two or three centuries, was one of the great study uh, locations for the Jews of Italy. It's right in the center, um, uh, near the top of uh, the region of Lazio, 
And it's one of the only places I know where the entire Jewish ghetto, it's still there. There's the old iron gate. There's a woman with a huge uh, key who will uh, open the ancient lock and let you come in and see the synagogue and also pl the uh, Passover oven that they use for making unleavened bread, the matzah. Um, and also um, the... Uh, They've stopped for now. I think it had to do with COVID, um, but they also have their own wines, a red and a white, and it's called uh, uh, La Piccola Jerusalemme, the Little Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, so their wine is named after the city. Let's go to the next one. And this is a symbol of Pitigliano. When the Inquisition finally came to uh, throw them out, uh, the... Um, town crier or the mayor, whoever it was, um, would come with a big, thick stick, like a club, uh, like uh, the British police used to, the, to this day. Um, and they would bang on the doors of the Jewish homes and say, get out, sfratto. Sfratto means you've been evicted. And uh, so uh, when the Jews were able to come back, they came up with this pastry that looks like the big, thick club for banging on doors, and it's called a sfratto, which means evicted. Uh, but inside, it's filled with chopped up uh, walnuts and dates, and it's incredibly delicious. Uh, great pastry, again, the symbol of uh, this community, which is no more. Um, when the Jews were liberated in the late 1800s, uh, the Jewish community of all of these scholars said, the heck with living up on this uh, mountain, just a few of us, we're going to move to the big cities because now we can't. So uh, they disbanded, but the ghetto is there. And fortunately, they still make kosher sfrati there. Uh, just had my last one a few months ago. Uh, next. Yeah. Now here, we come back to ancient Rome. And again, this is something when I'm giving a uh, lecture to historians, we can be in this one spot for hours. This is the ancient portico of Octavia, who was the uh, sister of the first emperor of Rome, Augustus Caesar, also a good friend to the Jews. He continued Julius Caesar's pro-Jewish uh, policies. Anyway, um, after the fall of Rome, this gorgeous portico. It was a big lounging area outside a gorgeous, a prestigious theater in, in Rome. Uh, and uh, the rich and famous would hang out there. There were, uh, I think they had Starbucks, but uh, they had a library, they had a snack bar, they had everything in this little area here. It was covered with gorgeous white marble. Uh, the inside was the red brick that we see today. Uh, after the fall of Rome, uh, over a, well over a thousand years ago, um, the people in the Dark Ages were trying to figure out what to do with the big white slabs of marble that the barbarians had stripped off of the building. So they put them up on bricks, and in the morning at dawn, they'd go down to the river, which was just a few yards or meters away, and uh, fill up buckets with ice-cold river water, and pour it all over the white marble slabs and they would become ice cold and retain that uh, cold for hours. So what are you going to uh, put on display that needs to be cold for a long period of time? And again, fish. the Talmud talks about this. Go ahead. The fish? Fish. You are looking at the fish market of medieval Rome. Now, it was uh, in the afternoons when things warmed up and the marble was no longer cold, this became the smelliest neighborhood in all of Rome. Uh, that's why the anti-Jewish Pope Paul IV uh, put us all in the ghetto with this building at its center because he said uh, the stinkiest place in Rome is that's where the Jews deserve to live. So everybody was forced in there. And this was the center of the ghetto. Uh, but they still every morning would uh, use the ice water from the river to col uh, to render the uh, slabs ice cold and display all the fish. This was in business, the fish market of Rome, until the year 1880. Uh, it had quite a long run. Um, and uh, on the front 
of the uh, portico, they had a strange piece of uh, marble sculpture. Let's take a look. Here it is. Uh, this is now in a museum. There's a, uh, a very humble uh, copy of this stuck on the wall uh, where this used to be. Um, and it says in Latin, uh, the head of the fish, uh, of this uh, marble fish, uh, this... <laughs> My dog, my dog likes fish. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway. Don't say fish then. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, to my eye, the, the fish underneath, it looks like a sturgeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A cetera. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, this is a measuring device. Uh, all of the fish merchants in Rome for many centuries were Jews. Um, and both the husbands and the wives, they all worked in the fish marketplace. Um, and uh, if you got a really prize fish um, and it was long and juicy, you had to hold it up against the fish that you see carved into the marble here. If it was longer than the fish portrayed in marble, it was too good for the Jews. You had to cut off the head of the fish down to the first fin. You see those fins mm -hmm. uh, under the, like the chin of the fish? Um, you had to cut off all of that, the head down to past that uh, first set of fins, wrap it up and give it in tribute either to the um, uh, men uh, running Rome at that time, the city council, or send it to the Vatican for the Pope's kitchen. The head of the fish was considered the best part of the fish, um, the tastiest flesh, and also they could use the head to make really good fish broth. So um, uh, the uh, if it was big and juicy and long, Jews didn't get it. Now, you can look at Jewish cuisine all over the world, whether it's from North Africa, Middle East, Europe, US, wherever, all of the Jewish recipe books have recipes for small fish. Think of herring, think of sardines. Um, uh, so this is why the Jews got used to having small fish. Um, the, uh, today, of course, you go to a restaurant in the Jewish quarter in Rome and you can get a huge chunk of fish to say to the, <laughs> to the haters from centuries ago. Um, Next. So let's see on our next slide here. Uh, one thing we did was also scraps of fish. Now, if you chopped up the fish and wrapped it back in its own skin and cooked it inside its own skin so it would hold that form, um, that, uh, that would be stuffed fish because you took the fish skin and you stuffed it with the ground up pieces, scraps of fish. And the way to say... Um, uh, the way to say uh, stuffed fish uh, in Yiddish is gefilte, gefilte fish. fish. Gefilte fish exists because of these ancient uh, anti-Jewish measures in ancient Rome. Uh, now, uh, we were kicked out of England for centuries, uh, from the 1300s until Cromwell lets us come back in in the 1600s. Um, actually, the 1200s, I believe. Anyway, um, when we're allowed back in 1600s, we come back with uh, Jewish cooking that's developed over the centuries. Um, and uh, there's one dish in particular that uh, the Jews bring into England and it gets popularized as transportation becomes modernized. So when they have railroad tracks and trains covering and connecting all of the British Isles, um, or at least the, the mainland, um, this Jewish dish, because we're wandering peddlers all over England, um, uh, we bring this to every corner of, of England. And uh, it's called in Italian, filetti di baccala, but in English, it's called fish and chips. Yeah. That's, and that's don't say the word for it. What? It's a staple of uh, British fast food. It, it, it's a symbol of English food. 
Yeah. Uh, but uh, as much as the haters would uh, be very shocked and disappointed to learn, they can look up in any history book about fish and chips. It will say that uh, the Jews spread it throughout England. Wow. So um, they can they can just get used to the idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, let's go to the uh, the next. And I don't mean all British people, of course, God forbid. I just mean uh, the haters. Uh, also in the former ghetto um, uh, of the Jews in Rome, uh, there's this ancient uh, dish. This probably goes all the way back to Roman times of uh, Catullus or Apicius. Uh, and this is pizza ebraica. It has nothing to do with tomato sauce and mozzarella cheese. Uh, pizza means dough. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> Everything's going crazy it's today. Fine, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> anyway, um, what was I going to say? The uh, this has everything. No, no, and sauce, it's just the door, yeah. I'm sorry. You said that it has the no, no. Uh, pizza is uh, means dough. Uh, yeah. The uh, so <laughs> it just means uh, dough, and this dough has everything and the kitchen sink in it. Uh -huh. It's got raisins. It got it's got currants. It's got nuts. It's got uh, handmade candied fruit. Mm -hmm. um, it, this is about it's about six seven inches long, and like half of a brick. Uh, in the town we we say e una bomba. It, it's a, a calorie bomb. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, it's delicious. You want half of these and you can run the seven hills of Rome. Mm -hmm. um, but on Sundays, when all the other pastry shops were closed, uh, the Jewish pastry shop was open. The same shop that was open in the 1700s is still open for business, still run by the same family, the Lamentani family. Uh, these very strong, very uh, independent women uh, for generations are running the shop. Um, and uh, if you're in Rome uh, and you're there on a Sunday, you'll see a very long line of people uh, waiting to get this. So um, one more symbol of Rome. Mm -hmm. Speaking of symbols of Rome, this is the number one dish of all of Rome. If you ask anybody in Rome, what is the number one dish that is symbolic of Roman cooking? They won't, it's not a meat dish. It's not a fish dish. It is fried artichokes and it's called carciofi alla Giudia, which means artichokes Jewish style. That's the actual name of the dish. Uh, there was a friend of mine, Michele, born and raised Catholic. Uh, visiting uh, me in Rome, and uh, he was originally from Rome. And he says, you people, uh, what do you eat? I just know Roman food. I don't know Jewish food. And, and I said, uh, Michele, what's your favorite dish in the whole world? He says, I'm a Roman. I said, Michele, for the first time in your life, say it slowly, not like it's all just one word. He says, okay, I'll stay for you slow. Carciofi, a la Jew. Oh my God, I've been eating your food. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> he didn't even know. So, um, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, that's uh, the story of artichoke. It's two so dishes. It's deep fried, right? The artichoke, uh, base of the artichoke, uh, um, how they call it? Yes. Flour, it's, an, but... it's an artichoke that is actually registered. Uh, with the um, World Heritage Society that it's protected. It's, um, it only grows on the hills outside Rome, this very oh. special uh, kind of artichoke. Uh, one thing that's different, if you're eating an, a regular artichoke, you have to just take some of the meat off leaf by leaf. Yeah, the and, base. And it's yeah. like 90% fiber, which you throw on a pile, and you just eat the little part that you can peel off on the inside. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Roman artichoke is rounder, and it's got a great purple color uh, before it's cooked, but also it has no fiber. You eat the entire artichoke. Oh. Uh, 
And uh, the way kids, let's say in the United States, they fight over who gets the drumstick or the um, uh, the, the uh, special bone in a turkey, uh, that uh, in Rome, uh, they fight over who gets to eat the stem. Now, uh -huh. if it, ordinary artichokes, the stem is inedible. It's all fiber. But in Rome, it's delicious. You eat the whole thing. Uh, it's like having two dishes in one. The outer leaves that you see here is almost like a golden, mm -hmm. uh, shiny look. Uh, those are like potato chips. And the inside is like a sweet potato. Uh, yeah, I, I've seen them uh, in Rome. I've seen them. Uh, they kind of half cook them and they put them in baskets outside sometimes. Or you can see them when you walk by, past the... Uh, uh, in the restaurant and then you know that they have it and then they mm -hmm. kind of uh, refresh it I don't know maybe some places they they make it from scratch like mm -hmm. as you come but some they places they have it outside just as advertising yeah because uh, all the tourists want to eat in the Jewish quarter and have uh, the Jewish style artichokes but at the very last uh, stage of the uh, cooking they take it and they push it down into the bottom of the uh, pot of oil. Mm -hmm. So the leaves spread out. Uh -huh. It looks like a sunflower by Vincent van Gogh. Yeah. Um, absolutely amazing. Yeah. So, and you, can, you can try it at home, by the way. I tried, I mean, I'm talking to my American audiences here. And I, I tried to do it in the air fryer, by the way. It didn't uh -huh. come out too bad. Uh, just don't don't skimp on oil. Just use good oil and uh, don't uh, dip them. You just uh, drizzle them, kind of dip them in oil, and then put them in the air fryer because you cannot. Yeah. Really this reminds me, by the way, of an old uh, joke from England um, that this man uh, wants to taste real authentic British fish and chips. Everybody <laughs> says, oh, uh, you want to go to the end of the street here. It goes to the end of the street, and it's a monastery. Uh-huh. Uh, a Catholic monastery. And he says, I I is here where I can get the, the dish? And he said, absolutely. He sits down, has the best fish and chips of his life. And he says, I got to congratulate you folks. I got to congratulate you folks. Uh, and he looks at one guy, he thinks he's going to be smart. He says, excuse me, are you the fish fryer? <laughs> and he says, no, I'm not the fish fryer. I'm the chipmunk. <laughs> I must say that if Italians would hear me doing this to artichokes, they would get crucified. <laughs> no, the, wor the worst the is when the people do things like uh, putting pineapple on their pizza. Yeah, that's a crime. In uh, this yeah. in this land of New York, it's a crime. Yeah, if somebody, oh, boy, yeah. If somebody was killed for uh, for putting pineapple on pizza, uh, no jury in Italy would find them guilty. <laughs> <laughs> So what do we else do we have here? We have the uh, wonderful... We're at our last stop. Uh, this is, if we think of Italy as a big boot, at the tip of the toe of the boot is uh, a section of the southern region of Calabria. They have amazing traditions. Um, and also people there now, after a pause of 500 years, are finding out uh, from old archives and church records that their family was originally Jewish and forcibly converted 500 years ago. Uh, so now uh, Jewish uh, traditions are coming out in the open again in all of Calabria. But there's one place that never lost it. Um, if you ask uh, any expert on uh, the citron, citron is um, like a larger big brother or big sister to lemons. Um, it's some of them get to be the size of a small grapefruit, um, and they're even more tart than a regular lemon. And they're used for Jewish rituals in the holiday of Sukkot and in the fall of the Jewish calendar. And uh, this, uh, this citron fruit is uh, a part of it. And uh, the place where they grow the best citrons in the entire world. I hate to say it, as, as an Israeli citizen, I have to admit the best are grown on the toe of the boot of Italy in Santa Maria del Cedro, which means St. Mary of the Etrog. 
Um, so if we uh, go ahead, we can see them growing in their special patch. And there you can see they're much bigger than regular lemons, uh, tastier. Um, and uh, every year people get arrested because they're trying to smuggle them back into Israel because they're of such uh, high um, uh, prestige. Um, but um, mm -hmm. Uh, they they do grow them, and what's interesting is who grows them. Um, it is a, a group of uh, people who have come together just for the etrog um, fields. Half of them are Calabrian Catholic farmers and peasants, mm -hmm. and half of them are Hasidic Jews, dressed in the long black coats with the hats, with the side curls, with the beards, and they work together. Over the uh, generations, they have developed their own language. Um, they, it's half Calabrian Italian dialect, half Yiddish from, from Brooklyn. <laughs> and the name of the language is Esregish, and they can talk to each other <laughs> in Esregish. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a great symbol of cooperation. Yeah. Uh, I have friends who go down there every year to help with the harvest. It, and there's a lot of joy there. How can you be sad when you're growing something that's yeah. so incredibly special? I was thinking about Dean Martin and his uh, famous, uh, hey, you Calabrese doing mamba like a crazy. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I think we've come to the end. Let's see. Yes. Yes. This is the, the one slide that we have here. And this is what we have to mention here. And I would be my honor to have this conversation with you, Mr. Dolliner. Uh, you're the uh, co-author of the book, uh, The Sistine Secrets, and it comes from your knowledge of Sistine Chapel. And the book is uh, famously available still on Amazon. And I'm looking for a book in Russian. If somebody has a book in Russian uh, translation uh, that was a pretty rare book, it turns out. We need one because Roy doesn't have his own copy in Russian. So some ambassador got away with it. Thank you for bringing that up. I appreciate yeah. it, Laura. And uh, the uh, yeah, uh, we're working on it, but um, it, it, it's just still hard to find. And considering the situation uh, nowadays, the communications, etc., we hope to obtain one, and uh, so Roy would have it. Yeah, that fantastic. Would be Listen, I, it was just great, and I'm trying to recreate the dishes that I was so impressed with. I kind of uh, managed the uh, anise, the fennel, uh, that I fell in love with in Sicily, and the artichokes are friendly to this household. And I know what you're talking about when you mentioned the Roman artichokes, we have them here, but still, I cannot get the, the choke out of it, you know, successfully. Yeah. You know, the, the, this stuff is there. But uh, it, I have my own special recipe for having the best uh, artichokes and uh, filet of bacala in the world. It's very easy. Uh, I go to Ben Gurion Airport, I get on an airplane, I land in Rome, and I go directly to the Jewish Quarter. Yes, that's the best. <laughs> Roy, thank you. Thanks again, and everybody, thank you all for coming. And uh, for those who will watch it later, so act act as uh, accordingly. <laughs> act accordingly. <laughs> <laughs> Roy, thanks. Okay. Shalom from Jerusalem. Das Bedanya. Thank you. Say uh, send a love to everybody. Will do.